So what this leads to is an analogy with the old claims of the alchemists who were able, uh, historically, they said, and there's some evidence that they were able to do it, to do low energy processes that produced gold from lead or mercury or other things. Um, this is now being done in laboratories and every instance I know of in the history of science where a small effect was seen initially to produce something was later scaled up. So there's, it's quite possible that our culture will enter an age of alchemy in which low energy processes can make precious metals. As we look toward the future, I believe we'll be able to find ways in which we can create the kind of elements that we need by these low energy nuclear reactions. I think we'll be able to start adding to or picking apart or changing the nucleus of atoms to be able to get the kind of stable atoms that we need. But more important, I thoroughly believe that we will be able to take the radioactive materials add a proton or add some changes to it and make those radioactive materials non-radioactive. And that is going to be a great boon to our present, uh, right, uh, to, our, to clean up the mess that we've left behind from our atomic bombs, from our nuclear power plants, and of course from things like Chernobyl. So in the future, we have laid the groundwork with cold fusion by which we'll be able to handle a whole array of nuclear changes that heretofore have been, have been outside of the current model of what can be done with nuclear reactions. There are many power companies throughout the United States that are now on alert and they're sending their representatives to cold fusion conferences. We meet them all the time. They give support. They, um, they really will be the vanguard of uh, the new energy age. Uh, I believe that uh, any utility company that does not get into this now is doomed because frankly, when we have generators of electricity and heat that can stay in a home or a building, uh, why would anyone want to be plugged into the grid, the wire grid any longer? This would make no sense. People will argue against that, but I think the grid will disappear. A remarkable process for sure, and one that offers exciting developments in the near future. But does the task of extracting energy from our environment really require such exotic, ultra-advanced technology that potentially would still put it under the control of large profit-driven interest? The rare metal palladium still have to be prospected, mined, and purified. Or are there simpler in design, low maintenance technologies available that could be bought off the shelf and installed by anyone for an affordable one-time fee? We're going to look in depth at several individuals and companies who have been working for years perfecting devices that they claim will do just that. No one person in the free energy field has been as determined and persistent as Mississippi inventor Joseph Newman. Since the 70s, Newman has been denied U.S. patents repeatedly on his energy machine, even though numerous engineers, scientists, and even congressmen have testified on his behalf. In 1968, I invented uh, a bike that would get a wheelie. And I used an 80-pound flywheel that I had built and took a positive plus out of a 30-horsepower motor, put it above the axis of the back wheel. A kid would get up on it, build up inertia in that 80-pound flywheel. He'd engage that positive clutch. Immediately, the front end jump up off the ground. It'd leave black seats on the pavement about that long, and kids' eyes would be, you know, get as big as a silver dollar. They were just ecstatic over it. But I had heard the word that a gyroscope was a stabilizer. So I went to the library, got a book on gyroscopes. And when I started reading the mechanical characteristics of a gyroscope, the question that had dogged my mind for three years, how did that current know which direction to go? And why was, it, why was it when you went parallel, you'd get nothing? I saw the laws of a gyroscope match that exactly. If you study the laws of a gyroscope, if you take uh, 
this little uh, gyroscope here, if I can spin it up, you can see that it does, but I think every kid knows it's true. Now, if you pivot that one direction, it goes one way. You pivot the other way, it goes the other way. If I turn it around 180 degrees, now if I push it up, it goes the opposite direction. Push it up, it goes the opposite direction. If I go parallel, it does not pivot. As long as I maintain a parallel position, that's exactly what happens when you move a conductor through a magnetic field. You push down on it, the current goes in one direction. You push up, it goes the opposite direction. You turn the magnet over 180 degrees, everything will reverse. You push down parallel to the lines of force uh, with the copper wire, and you get nothing. It told me that the energy in a magnetic field was a gyroscopic particle. Now, I didn't care what the rest of the world was saying because they couldn't answer my honest question. It was obvious to me the energy in a magnetic field consists of gyroscopic particles. It is the mechanical essence of Einstein's equation of equals mc squared. It moves forward at c and it spins at c. That's Einstein's equation of equals mc squared. It only occurs when you get atom alignment in material. I don't care if it's conductor, iron, what it is. When the atoms align, the magnetic field will appear, come outside the boundaries of the material, and gives you a running river that you can tap into. And what I'm going to show you is an energy technology that's going to totally change your life that the status quo power brokers have been fighting, and I'll show you the history of it. They didn't want you to have it, but you can see for yourself that this works, and the part of this for you is to see it, is to watch these meters, because these meters are going to show you that there's more power in this system than flows from this battery. The magnet runs down this shaft from one end to the other. It's peck shape with a six-sided, this blue represents a coil running this way. The red represents a coil running at right angles to it. The commentator shows that you break that circuit every 90 degrees. So you fire into one coil, fire into the next coil. Now you notice this gets higher as it's running because the battery starts getting charged. Now this one's going from 200 up to 400. You see that there's more current being produced by this system than those batteries are capable of delivering because batteries will not produce RF power. So the RF power must be coming from the motor. Now RF power is true power and the way you know this, this meter only works by converting the heat and the heat is converted into electricity because it runs through a resistor. It's a very accurate measuring device. So you're well over twice the current is flowing in this system than these batteries are capable of delivering and the batteries cannot produce RF power. Now this is real power. It has to be coming from the system. It clearly shows that the energy output of the system is greater than the energy inputted into the system. And that's what I've been saying. That's what's more than 30 scientists who came to my home from around the world. Some of them came all the way from England, signed affidavits that the invention worked. Uh, the special master to the court, Mr. William Schuyler, who was a former commissioner of patents, um, he was an electrical engineer. The federal judge chose him, saying his credentials were superb. He looked at those affidavits and gave the men the credit they were due. He said the evidence was overwhelming. The invention worked. There was no contradictory factual evidence. And the patent office had normally not followed the formalities of the patent law. To us as an observer, we see everything as motionless. We see objects and they sit still and everything in the shop sits still. And so we think that's to us, again, as to the observer, we think the natural state of our planet is non-motion. But when re in reality, you get down to the basic bank up of the atoms of this material, and you see that the natural state of the universe is motion. The unnatural state is what I have concluded is the lack of motion to the observer. Because that's when it, can, it forms into something and becomes a solid mass that will be interacted by other masses sitting close to it that causes it to sit still and not be able to travel because of its attraction. So we come along as the observer and we say the natural state of the, of the planets and the universe is lack of motion. Just like uh, we believe that so strongly, just several hundred years ago, we believed that the uh, Earth was the center of the universe and that uh, <coughs> we were everything. And they even believed that the stars, even back at Kepler times, was only uh, like a cake full of raisins three miles thick. And the stars were little tiny raisins in it. And that was our bias and our prejudice based on what we saw, that everything should centralize around us. And uh, I'm saying now we should open our eyes.